So here we are, third Sunday of Advent, and it uh, means that Christmas is just two weeks away. Quick calculation on the back there, that means some of us have 12 or 13 days before we have to start our Christmas shopping. <laughs> you laugh, but that's serious calculations for some of us. So uh, this year we've been emphasizing that Jesus is, first of all, our hope. Apart from Jesus, we have no hope. Secondly, he's our peace. Third, today, he's our joy. And then next week, he is love. When I was a, a kid and young adult, the churches that I attend, we didn't do any of this Advent stuff. No Advent candles, no Advent readings. And then when I went to seminary, I worked in a United Methodist church, and they had this rich tradition of, of Advent candles and stuff. And I thought, my goodness, I've missed all of this. I don't know any of this stuff. And it was a rich, rich tradition. And they're, in their church, they do the, the, the three purple candles, the one rose candle, and then the white uh, uh, Christ candle on Christmas Day. You've, you've seen the, the three purple and the pink one, right? Or rose-colored one. Uh, why am I telling you this? Well, today is the rose-colored candle. Across... Uh, uh, the world today, people are lighting that rose-colored candle. And what I want to tell you about a little bit is why the difference? Why do they change color? And it has to do with the meaning of the colors and the mood of the, of the advent. We know that purple represents, you've heard that a purple represents a, a royalty, right? Right? Jesus our king. But in the advent calendar, Purple is also the color of penance, of sacrifice, of uh, uh, surrendering ourselves to God. And so the emphasis on the first two weeks is that of repentance. The, the, we know we only have hope in Jesus when we repent. The path to peace with God involves repentance on our part. And so the mood for the first two weeks is repentance. Repentance. And then the change to joy, the change in color. Uh, if we have repented, we can now enter fully into the joy of Christ. That's what that color change means. I have a quote for you. Uh, it's going to appear up here. I think, yes. The quote is, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent. He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Does this quote sound familiar to you? Do you know who said that or who wrote that and where it comes from? I'll give you a clue. This statement plus 94 others were nailed to church doors in Wittenberg, Germany in November of 1517. Martin Luther. And uh, what he's saying is that repentance is the center of our lives. That we need to consider repentance every single day. Our, our uh, forgiveness isn't bought. It's free when we repent. Now Jesus told a parable in uh, Matthew chapter 11 that I, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody preach on it or teach on it, uh, but I love this parable, and it summarizes what I've been talking about today. The parable is uh, Jesus talking about the Pharisees, and he says, what, what shall I compare this generation, what shall I compare the Pharisees to? He says, they're like, you're like children playing in the marketplace, and you call out, I played the flute, but you didn't dance. I sang a dirge, and you didn't mourn. It's about children playing weddings and funerals and other kids not wanting to join in. And what, what this is all about, what this parable is about, is Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. And John came pre uh, preaching a, a message of repentance and the, the tax collectors and sinners went and repented. But the Pharisees didn't. And you know the excuse they gave? They didn't, they didn't want to repent, but the excuse they gave... Oh, John the Baptist, he's demonized. He's got a demon. And then when Jesus came, 
the tax collectors and fair, uh, the tax collectors and sinners were able to join in the joy with Jesus because they had repented, but the the Pharisees couldn't. They said, "Oh, Jesus, he's just a glutton and a drunkard." And what Jesus is saying is, unless we have repented with John the Baptist, what he's saying with them, unless you repent with John the Baptist, you cannot enter the joy of the first advent of Christ. And the same is true for us. Unless we repent, we can't fully enter into the joy of Christ. Now that's, I I, I think of all of that when I see the rose-colored candle. That's what it means to me. That, isn't that a rich tradition? Okay, uh, you probably want me to get on with the sermon, right? This was all uh, free bonus stuff, but some are saying, come on, Russ, get on with it. Okay, let's do this. Uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> uh, never mind. <laughs> um, I want you, as we start today, I want you to think of a Uh, somebody you know who you would call a a joyful person. When you think of that person, this person is joyful. Do you have somebody in mind? Give you a second. This is a joy-filled person. For me, it's a lady uh, named Betty Brown, lives in Winnipeg. Now, what else do you know about this person? For example, tend to be forgiving or likes to hold a grudge. Mm? Harsh and critical, or kind and gentle. Forgiving, I might have said that one already. Generous or stingy. The kind of people that I know who are joyful are people who are generous, loving, forgiving, peace-loving, meek, and so on. I could go on and on. Now, this is a chicken or egg kind of question. Are they generous because they are joyful? Or are they joyful because they're generous? Now, I got a kind of a secondary title to this sermon, which is also going to appear. And it gives away what I believe about this. That we are surprised by joy. And uh, I believe that joy isn't something that you can find by going and looking for it. Like if you made a resolution for next year, next year I'm going to focus on being a joyful person. It's not going to happen. Rather, we experience joy, we're surprised by joy, because it's a side benefit of other things in our lives. As we go about living our lives, we are surprised by joy because it is the fruit of of other things, other qualities in our lives. So in practical terms, what does it mean for you today that Jesus is your joy? How do you experience that joy? What does joy, or what does joy look like in your life? How does it become part of your life? As I already said, we don't experience joy Uh, by going out and seeking it. Rather, we're surprised by joy as other things start to bear fruit in our lives. Now, to get at this truth, we're going to look at a a common Christmas story. Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to ask Sharon to come and read for us. Matthew chapter 2 is the story of the Magi visit to Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who was born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So have you ever been sent to the airport to pick up somebody you don't know? Somebody you haven't even, you've never even seen a picture of the person. You don't have a clue what they look like. I, I've been on both sides of this thing, right? And, and uh, you know, you've, if you've been to the airport, you've kind of seen uh, the technique. Somebody stands at the exit with a sign, right? Delegates to such and such a conference or rust toes. That means they're, they're looking for rust toes and they don't have a clue what he looks like. Now, this method... Uh, I've, I've been on, as I said, I've been both, both sides of it. And it works really, really well, but it works on an assumption. And the assumption is that the person you're looking for wants to be found. If they don't want to be found, this doesn't work. You can imagine, right? Sign, rest toes. I walk up and say, ah, you're looking for rest toes, are you? Well, good luck with that. And I take off. It works on the assumption that the person you're looking for wants to be found. Today we want to look at this passage that Sharon just read, Matthew chapter 2. And I want to talk to you about experiencing joy as we look for Jesus. And he wants to be found by you. In the passage, the Magi came looking for Jesus and they found him. And I want us to learn some lessons with regard to joy and our search for Jesus. Now, my guess is all of us here this morning are looking, at Je- are looking for Jesus in one way or another. I don't think you'd be here if you weren't looking for Jesus. I, I guess it's possible that some of us were dragged here by someone else and we don't want to be here. I, I, I remember those days, right? Getting dragged to church by your parents. But even so, even so, even if you were dragged here today, I believe that you're not here by accident. You might not be looking for Jesus, but he's looking for you. And, and, and what does that look like? How, what does it look like when Jesus is looking for us? Well, one example of what it might look like. A while back I said that there's no peace with God without repentance. Repentance. And we might say, to her, I, don't, I don't believe that. That doesn't make sense. I don't want that to be true. <laughs> and yet, deep down inside, there's this sense, there's this voice saying, no, that is true. And I got to do something about that. That's just one example of how God might be speaking into your life, how God, you might know that God is seeking you. Now, as I said, all of us are on our journey of, of seeking God. Some of us might be on our way back to God. When we were young, maybe as kids, we connected with God, but then we got on living our lives. And we lived our lives as if he didn't exist. And we lost connection. But now we're feeling our way back to God. We're getting to know him again, maybe slowly, but we're on the way back. For some of us, we might be discovering God for the very first time in our lives. He's someone we don't know. And we're trying to figure out, can we really trust him? 
what would a relationship with him look like? And deep down inside, we know we're going in the right direction. And then I guess many of us here consider ourselves fairly close to God. But we recognize the need to keep our relationship with God fresh. We know the tendency of our own hearts is to drift away from him. And so we continually need to seek God, to search him out, to relate to him. As Martin Luther said, repentance is to be a daily thing. Seeking out God, finding our way back to him is a daily thing. God is so infinite that no matter how deep our relationship with him is, it can always go deeper. If we sit back and take our relationship with God for granted, we're going to drift apart. And the first sign that that is happening in our lives, or one of the first signs, is we tend to lose our joy. And so, as I said, we're all at very different stages in our search for God. And as we study this passage, I want to give you hope. I want to give you joy in your search. There are lessons that apply to us as we look at what the Magi did. And as I already said, the first point is God wants to be found by you. Jesus wants you to find him. This is a source of great joy for us. No matter where we are in our search for God, he wants us to find him in ever deeper levels of intimacy. Now in the Old Testament, there's an expression that appears four times and twice it adds a little, a little bit. To, but the expression is, if you seek me, you will find me. And twice it adds, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. God wants to be found by you. However, it does take determination on your part. Let's note the details of the story. Matthew 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, some of the details of the Christmas story as we often uh, hear them in kids' plays and that kind of thing or in storybooks are not what the Bible says. And one of those details has to do with the star. The wise men didn't, or the magi didn't follow the star from the east to Jerusalem. The star appeared. Somehow they understood that meant go to Jerusalem, and then it disappeared. And so they went to Jerusalem, and then in Jerusalem, they find out they're supposed to go to Bethlehem. And as they're going, it reappears, and that causes them to have great joy. If they'd been following it all along, they would have gone directly to Bethlehem without going to Jerusalem in the first place. Now, how exactly did the star thing work? Uh, we don't know. Uh, kind of, how, how did they know from seeing the star that they were supposed to go to Jerusalem. Well, part of it probably has to do with when the Jews were taken to Babylon. Uh, they took their scriptures, their teachings with them. And then when they were allowed to return back to Jerusalem, many of them didn't. And they spread out all over the place from there. And so these magi probably got in contact with people who had Jewish knowledge, Jewish teaching. And from there, they somehow understood that this, when the star appears, that means head for Jerusalem. Note this, though. God chose to speak to the Magi, the students of the stars, in a language that they could understand, namely a star. Studying the stars was their business. And God talked to them in their language because he wanted to be found by them. We don't know exactly how it worked, but from the star, the Magi knew to go to Jerusalem. Now, God wouldn't talk to us by a star. I can just see my, you know, me and my grandkids, kids, come and look, there's a new star, really bright, I've never seen it before. And they say, well, Grandpa, we're watching TV, maybe we'll come later. 
And that would be the end of it. <laughs> Message lost. When God wants to speak to you, he's going to speak to you in a language that you understand. Because Jesus wants you to find him. I also want you to note that this, this search required persistence on the part of the Magi. And it requires persistence on our part. In verse 7, it tells us that Herod met secretly with the Magi. Why? Why did he meet with them? Because he wanted to know the exact time that the star appeared. Why did he want to know that? Because that way he could determine the approximate age of this new baby king. Later in verse 16, Herod had all the baby boys that were two and under killed, hoping to kill this new baby king. That means the Magi could have seen the star nearly two years earlier. Now, the, the actual trip probably would take them about a month or maybe six weeks. But the preparation, gathering all the stuff they needed and gathering the gifts, a long period of time could have passed between when they saw the star and they actually arrived in Jerusalem. Jesus may have been close to two years old by the time they got there. When we search for Jesus, he wants to be found. But it does require persistence on our part. Remember the Old Testament verse? You will, when you seek me, you will find me. When? When you seek me with all your heart. Persistence on our part. Now note this. When the Magi arrived in Jerusalem, the answer to where Jesus was was clearly given to them from the Old Testament. The Old Testament scriptures clearly recorded where Jesus was going to be born. Verses 4 and 5, Herod calls the, the, the chief priests and elders, the teachers of the law together, and he asks them, where is the Messiah going to be born? And they reply, in Bethlehem of Judea, because the prophet had written it down. The Magi at that point had everything they needed to find Jesus. They knew his approximate age. They knew he was Bethlehem, that's a small town. They could have gone there and gone door to door and they would have found him. But God even made it clear. Verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. God even made it clear. Not only did they have it from the Old Testament, but this star appeared and led them directly to where he was. And they were filled with joy when they saw the star. How much more so when they actually saw the baby. Jesus wanted to be found by them, and he made it very clear to the Magi how they could do that. I nearly said he made it easy but that's not right. There was persistence required on their part. But he did make it clear. And it's the same for us today. Everything we need to know to find Jesus is right in this book. It's very clear. He didn't make it completely easy. There is persistence required on our part. But he made it clear. Consider this thought. You are as close to God today as you have chosen to be. You're the one who chooses if you're moving toward God or away from God. You're as close to God today as you have chosen to be. The first thing I want you to see is that Jesus wants to be found. If you're looking for him, he wants you to find him. This truth fills us with joy. The second part is this. What's the purpose of seeking Jesus? Verse 2, the Magi were looking for him. They said, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. They came to worship him. They came to give him gifts. They didn't come to get 
They came to give. We are to seek Christ for that same reason, to give, to worship, to give ourselves completely to him. Now, the kingdom of God works backwards from what the, world, the way the world works. Jesus said, the one who tries to save his life will lose it. But the one who loses his life for Christ will save it. This verse is about giving. And when we give, we end up giving, uh, getting. If we focus on getting only, we're going to end up losing. If we focus on giving, we'll end up getting. And in the end, we'll be surprised by joy. The kingdom of God works backwards from what we think it should. Jesus said, the greatest one in the kingdom is the one who serves. Again, it's about giving. It's about serving. We focus on giving, we focus on being a servant, and we end up receiving, becoming the greatest in the kingdom. Surprised by joy. The kingdom of God works backwards from the way the world works. Our culture, North American culture, has become very self-centered. The prevailing attitude and values of our culture has come into the church, has affects the church. And our culture and our, our um, mainstream North American views affect the way we worship and how we view this place. We come to receive a blessing in our lives, to receive instruction. And quite frankly, often we've bought into the selfish mentality of our society. When I was working on a degree through Fuller Seminary, we went and did this project down in uh, Minneapolis. And one of the things we discovered is there was, there was five or six really big churches in Minneapolis, and there was a group of about 3,000 people who would rotate between these churches. Whichever church had the greatest show that Sunday is where a lot of these people would flock. So the attendance could vary by 2,000 people from one Sunday to the next because this massive commercial uh, consumer mentality was taking hold and these people would just circulate between the churches. They were coming for the best show, for what they could receive rather than what they could give. I maintain that worship, biblical worship, is first and foremost a time for us to give, to give ourselves to God and to give ourselves to others in service. Our first priority is not to receive, but to give. Remember I said the kingdom of God works backwards from what we expect. Check out if this isn't true in your own lives. If we seek God only to receive, if we come to the worship service only to receive, we often end up leaving empty, not filled with joy. But if we come to give, to give worship, to give service to others, we end up leaving filled with joy. If we leave a worship service feeling empty, my guess is that's because we came only to receive. And what do we say? <laughs> that sermon sucked. I didn't get anything out of it. The worship, that was lame this morning, wasn't it? I didn't feel anything. That's the language of receiving. But if we seek God to give, we come to the worship service to give ourselves to God in worship, to give ourselves to others in service, we end up leaving full because the values of God's kingdom have been at work within us. And God's kingdom works backwards from the way the world works. Haven't you found that to be true in your own life? If it is true, what does that say to us about our worship services? It says we come, our when we come, our attitude must be focused on giving praise and adoration to God and encouragement 
and service to others. The Magi came looking for Jesus. Why? Because they wanted to give him worship. They wanted to give him the presence they had gathered. Their purpose in coming was to give, and in doing so, they received. They were overjoyed. That's how joy works in our lives as well. Then the last thing, the third thing, and I've kind of already said this, but the third thing I want you to note is the effect that their search had, first upon themselves and then upon others. The effect upon themselves is that they were filled with joy. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. How much more so, as I already said, how much more so when they actually saw the baby? As I already said, they came to give and they left filled. Is there anything better than being filled with the joy of the Lord, being filled with the joy of the Spirit? It's a mark of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. All of them were filled with joy, joy bubbling forth from their lives. The mystery of God's kingdom had worked in their lives, and they, thought, they sought to give, and they left filled. Now, the opposite example is also here in our story. When people truly seek God and they're earnest and they're passionate about seeing God or, or uh, seeking God, negative, cons, uh, negative aspects start to show up in other people's lives. And that's the case of Herod. The unexpected appearance of wealthy strangers in Jerusalem asking the question, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? It caused the whole city to be in a stir. You know why it caused the city to be in a stir? Because the whole city knew that when somebody asked that question, people were going to die. Because Herod had a terrible reputation. He killed anybody who he thought was a threat to his throne. Even his own kids. There is an expression. Herod was Jewish, so he didn't eat pork, right? There is an expression, you're better off being Herod's pig than Herod's son. Because he had a number of his sons killed just because they might someday take his place. So when Jerusalem hears, where's the one who's born king of the Jews? They know somebody's going to die. Herod told the Magi that he wanted to worship Jesus too. But his plan was to murder Jesus. Instead of giving, he was only interested in receiving and protecting what was already his. The Magi left filled, but Herod was left angry and empty. Oh, sure, he still had his kingdom. He still had his wealth. He still had all kinds of people to do all kinds of stuff for him. But not for long. We know from history that shortly after this, Herod died. Verse 19, in fact, says so. We know that he died, well, he was still alive, March, middle of March, in the year uh, 4 B.C. But we also know he was dead, middle of April, 4 B.C. So he died somewhere in that month, end of, April, end of March, beginning of April. And Christ could have been born uh, as early as... Uh, two years before that, 6 B.C. So really, this could be the year 2028. Uh, the, the actual calendar was only figured out in the, in the 400, 450, I think it was, and the guy working backwards was close, but he didn't quite get it right. So that Jesus was born somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C. Now, when Herod died, he lost everything. He lost his wealth, he lost his position, he lost all the people who were supposed to be serving him. He refused to give worship to God and he ended up empty. God's kingdom values at work. If we give, we are filled. We seek only to receive, we end up empty. Now what do we say in conclusion? Are you looking for Jesus today? I hope so. It's our continual life work. To continually seek him and stay in fellowship with him and go deeper and deeper into relationship with him. Well, if you're seeking Jesus, I can tell you this. First of all, 
He wants you to find him. And he's going to speak to you in a language that you understand in a way that makes sense to you. And secondly, our purpose in seeking Jesus is to give to him. To give our praise and our worship. As we focus on worship, as we focus on giving, we will receive. We will be filled with joy. We will be surprised by joy. Persistence is required on our part. Imagine I had to travel a long ways to find the child. But if you seek him, you will find him. And when you do, you will be filled with joy because Jesus is our joy. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I don't understand why you'd want me to find you. But I thank you that you put that little spark in my life that I started looking and that indeed you made it clear. And so you make it clear to all of us here. I thank you that you speak to us in a language we understand. I thank you that your kingdom principles work in our lives that when we seek to serve you, you surprise us with joy. I pray that all of us here today might find that joy this Christmas. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.